So I'm going to start the recording and welcome everyone to uh, join us. I'm glad you're with us and appreciate the, your time. Uh, I've uh, prepared some interesting cases uh, to discuss this morning. Um, to be completely honest, they are the cases that I uh, shared with my residents uh, just yesterday as we had a uh, session on uh, this month we've been studying ovarian tumors. And uh, so uh, the uh, challenge for them was to uh, deal with these as unknown cases. And uh, I will uh, try to share with you some of the things that we have uh, learned from looking at these cases um, together. Um, if, if you want to uh, get a little more basic understanding, that I've done a number of videos on each of the subcategories of ovarian tumors. And you could uh, certainly uh, look some of those up uh, to study further. Uh, but uh, we will uh, go forward with uh, these cases as uh, cases and unknowns. And uh, this is the first one. Um, of course, the history in any of these is that uh, there's an ovarian mass. And uh, so that's the one constant, uh, but age and uh, stage and other manifestations of ovarian disease uh, can be uh, quite different. So this was uh, in an adult patient, uh, probably in her late 40s and 50s, as I recall. Um, and the, obviously the mass was mostly solid it was, uh, I think, six or seven centimeters in size, so not huge. Um, and you can see that uh, it's got kind of a mixture of pink and blue. Uh, at low magnification, you can see there's probably some glandular structures here. And uh, we'll take a look at these. As you see, uh, the glands are not closely spaced. They're sort of separated by this uh, loose purplish stroma. And as we look at the individual glands here, you can see that they're kind of columnar cells. There's not a high degree of uh, anaplasia or atypia. Um, and in general, the surface of the gland is fairly flat, a little bit of tufting, uh, but generally a fairly sharp mar margin between the cells and the uh, lumen. And then the surrounding tissue is somewhat vascularized and then merges into a fibrotic background. So this type of a picture, um, these type of glands would make me think about endometrioid type of glands. And uh, the stroma uh, looks a little bit like endometrial stroma around the immediate portion of the glands, but in other areas, as we come over here, you'll see that that amount of stroma, say for a, a, a gland or two like these, is, is absent. It's essentially nil. So the differential, what I'm thinking that these are endometrial type glands would be between uh, endometriosis and um, an endometrioid adenofibroma. Here's another feature that we can see in these endometrial tumor, endometrioid type tumors, and that is here it becomes more solid. Um, and this is a, a form of what we generally refer to as squamous metaplasia or squamous morular metaplasia uh, in these tumors. Now, uh, how could we distinguish this from endometriosis? Well, there are a couple of uh, features that I think help to distinguish it from endometriosis. Uh, one is that you don't see evidence of cyclic uh, changes. That is, you don't see areas where the glands have sloughed and hemorrhage has occurred. And so you get a lot of histiocytes and hemosiderin deposition. Um, and I don't know why these glands don't seem to cycle uh, quite like a normal endometrioid glands or endometriosis, uh, but it's pretty evident that they don't uh, have that uh, change. Um, 
The other thing that I think helps you is the relative lack or paucity of stroma. So the fact that we find glands that are immediately next to dense fibrous tissue like this uh, makes it an adenofibroma rather than adenomyosis. But as you can see, there's a, a bit of a spectrum. And some areas, like the areas we looked at over here, do look a little bit more like there's endometrial type stroma. Now, this is a benign lesion, um, uh, the endometrioid adenofibroma. But uh, these lesions can become uh, or can be classified as borderline uh, in some circumstances. And in that setting, the glands are more prominently like these, a little bit more closely spaced, a little bit more stroma, and a little bit more atypia, uh, such that they sort of begin to resemble atypical hyperplasia. Uh, I don't think the glands in this particular case um, have that uh, texture yet uh, to make this into a borderline endometrioid adenofibroma. And of course, uh, on occasion, these lesions can evolve or develop into uh, various types of cancers that are derived from endometrial type glands such as endometrioid adenocarcinoma or clear cell carcinoma or occasionally um, carcinosarcoma. So um, I will mention as we go along, if you have questions, please uh, don't hesitate to, to speak up or if you'd rather just type them into the chat box and we will cover them at the end of the meeting. Um, so we'll take uh, the next case here, um, which is uh, a, uh, another ovarian mass in an adult patient. Um, and as you can see here, there's a more clear-cut uh, blue tissue. Uh, this was partly cystic and partly solid. And uh, the epithelial component has this uh, papillary pattern of architecture. Now, in this case, um, when we look at this epithelium, for example, in this area, um, it, it shows nicely that there's uh, some mixture of cells here. So we have these tall cells like this that have this tufted surface. And then we have some cells in between that look like there's some bluish um, mucinous type of epithelium here. Um, and in fact, uh, we did a, a mucicarmine stain and many of these more bluish areas stained with mucin, whereas uh, these other tall cells did not. Uh, and there was mucin inside the lumen. So when we see this appearance of a, a mucinous epithelial cells admixed with these uh, cells, which in some instances can be found to have cilia. Uh, this is the category of seromucinous tumors. Uh, it's not a very common ovarian uh, 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 epithelial type, um, but uh, it, it's important to, uh, to recognize because uh, they do have a slightly different uh, behavior. Now, uh, the other feature is that at low magnification, many times these seromucinous tumors can look very much like uh, papillary serous tumors of the ovary. Um, so for example, over here, uh, at low magnification, uh, this lesion might look uh, like a uh, serous borderline tumor. And that is uh, an important thing to remember at uh, low magnification that the seromucinous and serous tumors can have very similar uh, low power architecture. Um, the other uh, categories in these uh, lesions is that we have <clears throat> several WHO classification areas. 
So there are the, the benign lesions, the serocystadenomas or the seromucinous cystadenomas that are considered completely benign. Uh, and then we have the borderline groups where we get more complexity to the uh, architecture. And then there are uh, two additional categories that are uh, important to remember. Uh, and one is uh, the borderline tumor with intraepithelial carcinoma. Uh, and then finally, borderline tumor with intraepithelial carcinoma and focal microinvasion. Uh, so this tumor, uh, I pointed out some of the low-grade epithelium like this, but we also have areas like this, where you can see there's uh, uh, more nuclear enlargement, uh, there's more uh, pleomorphism to the nuclei, uh, the uh, Associated inflammation here also is telling you that there's a little bit of something different going on here. So this may be a, an area of intraepithelial carcinoma. I think you can see here uh, how different this uh, appearance is uh, with these very large atypical cells. So um, as we looked around this tumor, and you want to sample these quite generously because Sometimes these foci of intraepithelial carcinoma are localized. They're not present in every section. Um, we sample them generally uh, one or more sections per sonometer of the size of the lesion. This was, I think, a 20 sonometer lesion. So we had 20 sections. Um, and in this particular area, you'll see that there's a little bit of a different change here. So here we have what looks like the intraepithelial carcinoma, but then notice how here the um, stroma changes a little bit and the stroma is inflamed as well. So looking at this area more closely, we can see that there are atypical cells within this stroma. And these are, in fact, areas of intraepithelial carcinoma with microinvasion. So this is the microinvasive component uh, in this tumor. So this is an unusual uh, scenario. This is not well described. Um, currently in the WHO, seromucinous tumors only exist as borderline tumors plus or minus intraepithelial carcinoma, rarely described intraepithelial carcinoma with microinvasion. Um, there's a question as to why there isn't a <clears throat> invasive seromucinous carcinoma. And uh, that is, uh, I guess, a, a question for some of the classification gurus to uh, undertake. Um, but I suspect uh, that there are uh, those type of lesions, albeit they're probably quite rare. Uh, currently, they're probably classified as endometrioid tumors or some other classification. So this, uh, again, was an example of a seromucinous tumor with uh, extensive intraepithelial carcinoma and at least uh, focal microinvasion. Now, interestingly, in most of these uh, borderline tumors with microinvasion, the follow-up has generally been similar to a regular borderline tumor. So in terms of adverse outcome, uh, we're not convinced that this is a bad sign, but certainly it merits more close follow-up and uh, potential opportunities for study to see what are the factors that may trigger that uh, development of uh, intraepithelial carcinoma, microinvasion, and so forth. Okay, let's go on to this tumor. So here's another ovarian lesion, and um, we can see there's sort of a, a distinction here between the outer cortex of the uh, 
um, lesion. Oh, I see that uh, Dr. Tseng, you've raised your hand. Would you like to speak up and ask a question? Yes, um, so Dr. Hassel, so um, is there a clear cut cri criteria between the micro invasion and the true invasion in the see, previous case? Yes, that's a very good question. So micro invasion is defined as an area of invasion that is less than five millimeters in total size. So on this previous case, um, the micro invasive area uh, was just in this single area and it was actually less than two millimeters in size. But uh, in the literature, several thresholds have been used for microinvasive foci um, up to five millimeters. But anything beyond that, you would just call it, you know, invasive carcinoma. And that applies to every focus. So you can have more than one focus of microinvasion that are less than five millimeters, and it still would be called microinvasive. But if any one of them becomes larger than that threshold, then uh, you would call it invasive uh, carcinoma. I generally oh, will. I, I will generally report how many foci of microinvasion are present, and the, the size of the largest one. Okay, so it's the greatest dimension of the um, in, uh, invasive foci, yes. foci then. Yes, that's yes. correct. Okay, I think, thank you, yes, yes, yes. Okay, so this next case, as I was indicating, has some uh, normal ovarian structures here on the surface, the theca cells, some corporate albicantia, and so forth. And then we have this neoplasm here. Um, and as you can see, it's mostly solid. It's nested and sort of lobulated. And as we come into higher magnification, uh, we see that the, the cells are, are large. Um, there's quite a bit of cytoplasm and some of it is kind of clear cytoplasm. Uh, the nuclei are uh, kind of have uh, uh, prominent nucleoli in some areas. There's a degree of variation. Uh, and the cytoplasmic membranes are fairly sharp in many areas. So there are a couple of tumors that are a couple of cell types that have these sharp cell borders. Sometimes they're squamous cells, uh, sometimes transitional cells. And uh, in ovarian tumors, uh, clear cell tumors can also have sharp uh, cytoplasmic borders with, with cleared out cytoplasm. So those three epithelial types would be under consideration here. Um, we don't see a keratinization, but a non-keratinizing uh, squamous tumor would be possible. Uh, but squamous cancers or squamous tumors in the ovary are pretty rare, pretty well undescribed, uh, except in the case of uh, coming out of a teratoma or something of that sort. Clear cell tumors usually do not have this solid nested growth like this. Um, they tend to form uh, glandular spaces or have tubulocystic patterns rather than large nested sheets of cells as we see here. So probably we would think this is more likely to be a transitional type of epithelium, uh, which we know can occur in the ovary. Uh, the transitional tumors in the ovary uh, include the Brenner tumor, uh, which is a uh, mostly fibrotic uh, tumor with occasional nests of uh, transitional type epithelial cells. And the borderline Brenner tumor, where you have a, uh, uh, a more proliferative pattern, you may get some papillarity to those nests um, and some degree of atypia. 
the malignant Brenner tumor, where the epithelial component is clearly uh, carcinomatous, and I think this would come pretty close to that category. Uh, certainly, the proliferation is very pronounced, and the cells are um, uh, ple pleomorphic enough. Uh, in addition, we have these areas of kind of oops, inflammation or um, necrosis uh, into the lumen, that sort of thing. Um, then there has been discussion as to whether or not there's an actually a transitional cell carcinoma uh, of the uh, ovary. And in general, as they have investigated those cases that previously were classified as transitional cell carcinoma of the ovary, uh, those have been found to have the molecular characteristics of uh, serous carcinoma. And so I think most people currently do not believe that there's a true de novo transitional cell carcinoma of the ovary. Uh, that it falls into the category of uh, so-called SET tumors, which stands for uh, serous pseudoendometrioid and transitional tumors that all would have a P53 mutation. So uh, with that description, you're probably thinking, well, this looks like a malignant Brenner tumor because it's forming large nests, they're proliferating, there's atypia here as well. To make life interesting, however, this patient had um, a history of transitional cell carcinoma of the bladder. And uh, that was an invasive tumor, it was a high-grade tumor. And so in that setting, uh, I think it's almost impossible to distinguish um, a malignant Brenner tumor from a metastatic transitional uh, or urothelial carcinoma. Um, but certainly given the kind of uh, unifying diagnosis uh, desire we have, uh, most likely uh, this would be classified as a metastatic urothelial carcinoma. And I'm not aware that there are any specific markers that would allow you to separate those two entities or those two possibilities. So uh, I guess the, the other uh, thing to remember here is that uh, metastatic tumors to the ovary uh, can oftentimes mimic several different patterns of uh, native ovarian tumors. Questions or comments on that case? Okay, we'll take this, we'll take this theme a little bit further. So this was uh, another case <clears throat> uh, which uh, actually created some problems for some of our junior residents. As you can see, there's no uh, residual normal architecture here. Um, and uh, much of this uh, tissue in the ovary, which was quite enlarged, about at 12, 13 centimeters, uh, has this kind of loose uh, appearance of uh, fibrous tissue. Um, and then uh, we see there are kind of these uh, bounded areas uh, with um, sort of rounded uh, contours of more purplish uh, hue um, associated with it. So as we come into higher magnification, um, we can see that there is an abnormal cell population here. Uh, that has these nice uh, sharply demarcated vacuoles or, or spaces filled with sort of a slightly blue uh, substance. And then the nuclei are often pushed off to the periphery. So uh, these would be uh, easily classified or thought of as signet ring cells, where you have the a clear space and a peripheral small nucleus uh, pushed against the side. So um, 
signet ring cells in the ovary uh, most commonly represent uh, a uh, metastatic tumor, a metastatic signet ring or poorly differentiated, poorly cohesive carcinoma, oftentimes from the stomach, uh, but could be from the gallbladder, pancreas, or other locations as well. However, it's important to remember that there is also a, uh, uh, a stromal tumor uh, that can have uh, signet ring cells. Um, and so uh, the, the signet ring stromal tumor would be in the differential diagnosis of this case uh, as well. The distinction here is not terribly diff difficult uh, for two reasons. One is that uh, it's likely that all of this clear space in between these uh, stromal cells is uh, mucin. Um, and so this actually may be what we call pseudomyxoma ovarii, uh, similar to pseudomyxoma peritonei, where you have just acellular, extracellular mucin that is uh, densely infiltrative of the peritoneum, or in this case, of the ovary. And a simple mucicarmine stain would nicely demonstrate that mucin as well as the intracellular mucin uh, in these uh, neoplastic cells. Of course, you could also do a cytokeratin stain as well. Now, with these uh, poorly cohesive gastric cancers, um, we're learning that many of them have a CDH1 uh, familial uh, germline mutation or a CDH1 or RHOA uh, mutation that imparts to them this poorly cohesive nature. If they are patients with the germline CDH1 mutation, then they are also at high risk of lobular cancer of the breast. Um, and so that also becomes a consideration um, in patients with this uh, disorder. All right, let's go on to one more uh, while we're moving along here. Uh, this was a, an interesting case we had a few months ago. Um, it's a younger woman. I think she was 24 or 25. And, and she had a, about a 18 centimeter ovarian mass. It was unilateral. Uh, no evidence of peritoneal disease. Now, when they operate on a patient of that age, actually, when they operate on just about any patient with an ovarian mass, they will usually do some preoperative serum markers looking for any potential tumor marker that could be useful in follow-up. So in this particular patient, uh, the AFP was elevated um, and that suggested to them that she might have a yolk sac tumor. So we will look at the majority of this tumor was of this uh, appearance with uh, a lot of intervening areas of necrosis. Um, and then these uh, malignant looking cells with uh, enlarged nuclei. And I think you can see there are a few nucleoli here in some of these cells um, with slightly cleared cytoplasm, pale cytoplasm. And again, reasonably prominent uh, cell borders. Um, in addition, I think you can see here that there are a scattering of smaller nuclei in between uh, these malignant cells uh, that uh, could be lymphocytes. Um, and so this is a fairly characteristic appearance of a germ cell tumor, uh, the dysgerminoma. Um, which is comparable, of course, to the seminoma in the testis. Um, so we looked at this case and, and had uh, quite a few areas that had this pattern. Here's another area 
of this this germinoma pattern as you see cords and sheets and nests of these cells with a few scattered intervening lymphocytes. So these cells would be positive for PLAP and cell 4 and so forth on immunohistochemistry. But we hadn't accounted yet for the elevated AFP. And so if you've got that sort of history of an elevated marker that you don't have that you don't have a histologic explanation for that, you need to look a little bit more full, more carefully, uh, more sections or uh, reevaluate what you've seen. The same would be true if you had beta HCG. So this area here looked a little bit different from the other areas that we have uh, looked at so far. And you can see there's more open areas. Um, the cells um, maybe look a little bit uh, different. The nuclei are not quite so hyperchromatic. They tend to be lining uh, sort of uh, structures, uh, maybe forming pseudoglandular spaces in this way. They have some central vessels. Um, and uh, as you can see, there's just a little bit lower grade appearance to them and a different uh, histologic pattern. So in fact, this is uh, an area of yolk sac tumor that would account for the presence of the um, elevated alpha fetoprotein. We didn't find a lot of this, but having found enough of this to account for our markers, uh, we felt confident that this was um, a mixed germ cell tumor with mostly dysgerminoma and a minor component of uh, yolk sac tumor. Now, uh, many people, when we mention yolk sac tumor, they immediately say, where are the Schiller Duval bodies? Um, and uh, that's a good question because if you find a good Schiller Duval body, uh, that is a truly pathognomonic of uh, yolk sac or endodermal sinus tumor. Um, but only a small percentage of yolk sac tumors will have demonstrable. Uh, uh, Schiller Duval bodies. Um, <clears throat> this is perhaps as close as we come here. We have a central vessel here with uh, a little bit of surrounding tissue and then a larger uh, cystic area uh, that has this uh, feature. Now, uh, it's very interesting to note uh, Dr. Schiller was a pathologist. Um, who emigrated from Germany in the 1930s. And while working in Chicago, he described uh, a number of tumors that he thought were derived from the uh, primordial uh, you know, embryonic yolk sac. Um, and so eventually uh, his name came to be associated with this uh, entity. Uh, which was more fully described by others uh, later on and separated off. But of interest, uh, my mentor, Dr. Scully, um, had the opportunity to review Dr. Schiller's 10 cases uh, in which he made this uh, demonstration uh, or, or claimed that these were derived. Uh, and of course, these were separated, these observations were separated by about uh, 40 years of observation and study. And uh, as Dr. Scully evaluated the cases that Dr. Schiller had initially reported, uh, it was interesting to note that to his eye, uh, about half of them were actually clear cell carcinoma rather than, you know, endodermal sinus tumor, yolk sac tumor. But the distinction was almost entirely uh, made or easily made if you took age of the patient into account. So all of Dr. Schiller's cases that 
uh, Dr. Scully thought were clear cell carcinoma occurred in patients who were 45, 55, 65 years old. And all of his cases, which he thought were definitely yolk sac tumor, were in patients under age 35. So uh, age does make a difference in the presentation. And uh, it's uh, interesting to see how, as time develops, we become a little bit more adept at separating things out and understanding the uh, clinical scenarios that uh, develop. OK, so let's go on to one other case type here in our last few minutes. Um, so uh, this is a tumor uh, from a younger patient. And uh, as you can see, it sort of has a nested pattern. It has areas of uh, um, growth and so forth. But we also see that it has these slit-like spaces, a few follicle-like spaces, and uh, a, pat a fairly unusual pattern. So this type of a pattern um, should remind you of the reedy ovary. Um, these sort of slow cuboidal cells with slit-like spaces, somewhat angulated, and so forth, as in this situation. Um, and there is uh, one tumor that um, should jump out at you as having a reedy-like pattern. Um, and that tumor would be a rediform Sertoli-Leydig tumor. In that, in that tumor, the uh, Sertoli cells are what are forming this reedy-like structure. And the Leydig cells may be extraordinarily rare in this uh, particular variant. Um, it's almost to the point of being non-demonstrable. Uh, um, we don't have a pure rediform Sertoli tumor, um, but um, this is, uh, I think, a nice example of this very florid rediform pattern um, of a Sertoli lytic tumor. Now, uh, you might think in the differential diagnosis here, you might have things like, say, a female adnexal tumor of possible Wolfian origin or FATWA. Uh, you might have other entities uh, like maybe endometrioid or something like that as a possibility. Um, and those, you could use immunohistochemistry to help differentiate those. So for example, the markers that we use for sex cord stromal tumors and Sertoli lytic tumors include things like inhibin, calretinin, uh, MART1, uh, WT1, and so forth, which uh, should be uh, quite uniformly positive in these tumors, uh, but would be negative. Um, in the FATWA, although the FATWA might be positive for calretinin as well. So uh, this is a very well-developed example of the rediform Sertoli lytic tumor with, as, as you can hunt here and hunt here as I'm doing and, and not be able to find good uh, lytic cells. Uh, and that's okay. Usually this pattern is not the entire tumor. So usually there will be other areas of the tumor that will be more readily identifiable as a Sertoli lytic tumor. Um, and I'm just trying to see if I've got an area over here that I can do that with. Um, I 
but um, in the event that uh, that you don't find that, uh, you can, um, I believe, still in the appropriate setting, call this a, a redeformed Sertoli lighting tumor. Now, the importance of that diagnosis is is that the redeform variant um, has been generally found to be a somewhat more aggressive uh, or worse prognosis tumor than the uh, standard Sertoli lighting tumor. So here you're getting more of this tubular formation uh, that would be uh, good for uh, the Sertoli lighting tumor uh, in a more conventional pattern. Let's go on to another tumor. Um, somewhat unusual tumor, occasionally uh, don't see this very often, uh, but we do have circumstances where it appears. And as you can see, we have really no residual normal looking ovary here. This was a young patient, uh, I think in their early teens. Um, and a lot of this uh, tissue is kind of this calcified mass, as you can see here. It's very, very uh, rounded, nested, lobulated areas. And we see maybe a few areas of some cells in between here. But notice these rounded, spherule-like structures, and then these uh, clear cells here. So we'll look a little bit more carefully for some other areas that may show residual tumor, because these areas are areas of tumor that have become calcified. So here's an area that's not calcified, and I think we've got a better one over here. Yes, I think we have a little better area here. Here we can see um, what I really would hope will become evident to you. So we see this intervening pink material. We see these uh, smaller cells associated with this. And then we have these larger clear cells uh, with enlarged nuclei as well. Uh, so there's kind of two populations there. And then we can see sort of coming out of this eosinophilic material is what's developing into these calcified bodies here. So um, let's see, there's another area that will demonstrate this as well. Oh, yes, here we are. So if we have an area that looks like this, with this eosinophilic material and these rounded calcified areas, this is the appearance of gonadoblastoma. And gonadoblastoma is a, an uncommon uh, tumor that most often occurs in younger patients, pediatric age patients, that may have some form of gonadal dysgenesis or other uh, abnormalities of sexual differentiation. Um, maybe they have a street gonad or something of that sort. Um, and this is kind of the classic appearance of that. It's these rounded spherules that go on to calcify and intervening small blue cells uh, that uh, have uh, strom sex word stromal type of uh, features. The problem with these patients is that these patients are very prone to develop gonadoblast, excuse me, prone to develop dysgerminoma. And so what we are seeing here in these clear cells is dysgerminoma. So these cells will stain with PLAP and so forth, whereas uh, these cells down here that we looked at, these type of areas would not stain with those germ cell markers, uh, but, but would rather stain with the uh, um, I believe the sex word stromal markers that we talked about briefly. So uh, it's an uncommon scenario, uh, but uh, over time, obviously, the dysgerminoma uh, can become the dominant uh, 
component, as you see it is becoming here where you have viable tumor. And if it goes further, may become actually uh, a more encompassing uh, tumor, uh, dysterminoma, potentially metastasize, and so forth. And that's why in these individuals, you know, uh, an early uh, um, oophorectomy or uh, uh, castration essentially uh, would be desired so as to avoid the possibility of this uh, dysterminoma becoming uh, a dominant and potentially uh, more uh, serious uh, neoplasm for them. Well, we've uh, come to the top of the hour, and uh, I, I think we can, we can stop here. Um, do you have any questions that you want to ask, anyone want to bring up? Hello. Let's see, Dr. Hui. You have your hand up. What would you like to ask? Uh, just me, Doctor. <clears throat> I have one question about the last um, the last case. You, you saw about the gonadoblastoma. Uh, I would like to ask you, it can be combined with the immature teratoma of the young patient? <clears throat> um, that's a good question. I, I think that that's possible. I have never seen that, uh, that scenario, but I have seen several times the combination with dysterminoma. But it may depend a little bit on kind of where you're working. I we don't I don't work as much with pediatric patients. Uh, they yes. go to our pediatric pathologist, so they may have seen that more frequently. Um, I'll I'll ask them that question and get back to you. Yes, it is a bit difficult to differentiate between the uh, blood cell in the immature teratoma because it itself is a small round blue cell. Yes. And some calcification and some have the ossification or something like that. So that's why I asked you that the gonadoblastoma, it can be combined with the immature teratoma. Yeah, very good. Very good question. I'll, I'll uh, ask Dr. Yu and uh, maybe get back to you uh, directly. Thank you so much. Yeah. Dr. Sang, you had a question. Uh, yes. Um, so, um... I have a, a question for the previous case about the cell related tumor. Um, in 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 cell related cell tumor, do you usually grab the tumor? If so, um, in that case, is that a G one or a G two? Yes, we do grade Sertoli lytic cell tumors. Uh, you know, well differentiated, intermediate, or poorly differentiated ones. Um, the that's a I don't I don't know specifically how the reform tumor is usually graded, but it's usually well enough differentiated that it's in the grade one or grade two category. But if you classify it as a redeformed tumor, they will recognize, the, the clinicians will recognize that that's a poorer prognosis tumor, kind of independent of grade. The grade three tumors are usually almost sarcomatoid and uh, can be quite difficult to distinguish from you know, other spindle cell neoplasms sometimes, other than they occur in a younger age group and uh, you may have some sex cord stromal markers in the, uh, the, the more spindleish uh, sarcomatoid areas. Any That's other questions? Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone for a very enjoyable uh, morning. And uh, I'll be posting the video recording of our uh, program together uh, later this weekend. And so you can look for that if there were any points you missed. Um, I will mention that the June program uh, will be delayed a week because I am going to be traveling during the third week of the month. And so uh, look for a, a late in the month uh, program rather than the third week. Thank you for joining me. Have a good evening. Good day. Thank you. Please have a good day.
Yes, have a good day. Thank you.